Welcome to the One Within All to another episode of Interverse Podcast. I'm your host, Chance, and we all know something is very wrong in the world, especially for beings who enter this realm through a hospital. Not only are there needles and pharmaceuticals in the mix, but there's an unwilling contract at birth to become a citizenship, opening us up to receive shoddy goods and services in exchange for our natural rights as living men and women. The maritime legal sorcery of your DOB is a sorry state of affairs indeed, and nobody quite breaks it down like our guest today, Kurt Kallenbach. A hero of the spirit and life force energy of our divine source and nature, Kurt has a lot to say about one of the most overlooked yet intensely significant aspects of our lives, how we came into the world, what we came with, and what we gave up on those dismal hospital shores. Most importantly, he can help us see the path to get it back. You can find Kurt's website at nojellyfish.xyz, and uh, he may have ha other things that he wants to link us to. So once we get in talking, he'll let us know. I'm really excited to have this conversation today. What's up, Kurt? Welcome to the show. <laughs> wow, what an introduction. Appreciate it, man. That's pretty, that's pretty cool after all these years. <laughs> yeah, I want to get back into writing nice intros. And so I'm like stepping up my game. I took down the green screen, looking a little more professional. And uh, wrote the intro out today, which has been a while since I did. Been That's flying fine. by the seat of my pants. But this subject does require us to hook in and pay attention because it's really deep and important stuff. I've been researching the subject of the placenta and afterbirth from an esoteric standpoint for quite a few months now and finding symbolism corresponding to it through all kinds of occult literature, ancient artwork, secret society mythos, but it's encoded. So maybe you could just let a rip and open up and let us know exactly like, uh, you know, where you're coming from, start from the beginning or tell us who you are, <laughs> your choice. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll give a brief introduction. I, um, I'm just like everybody else. I was just a regular guy out there doing, you know, regular things back in uh, 2005, six, seven, whatever. And I launched a golf company down at the PGA show in 2008, January, Orlando. And I ended up um, with base in the top three new products that year at the PGA show, professional golf show. And I thought <clears throat> that was it. You know, I, I I promised my wife that this this particular product, this particular company was going to be the thing that sets us free financially. And it it probably still could be um, even today after, you know, 14 years or whatever. But what happened was um, after that show, probably nine months after that show, I was looking into my patent. I had a design patent on my product and I started questioning the attorneys, the patent attorneys about it. And I got this weird feeling, this vibe that I didn't really own the patent in some way. Um, and it had something to do with the name I was using or something along that line. I had no idea in 2008 um, what was going on in the world. None, zero had no interest. You know, I didn't even think about the World Trade Center being an insider job, if you know what I mean. I didn't think of any of that stuff. Um, so I, I, my heart goes out to the people that, that look up in the sky and don't see chemtrails. My heart goes out to people that don't understand the ramifications of fluoride in the water. My heart goes out to people that don't understand what it's like to have amalgams in your mouth, which is mercury, which is incredible poisonous substance. My heart goes out to all the people that are basically ignorant of the truth at this point, but I would, because I was one of them. Now here's the difference. <clears throat> Once I realized that I didn't really own the name or I didn't own that company squared away golf for some reason, I got angry. I got angry because it was my baby. It was my intellect that created that product. And when somebody else steps in and says, basically, this is not your stuff, this is not your property, that's the point where I said enough is enough. I'm not even going to give this product. I'm not putting this product out until I know the truth. Well, here it is. What, 14? 14 years later, 15 years, 12 years later, something like that. And I found it. I actually found the one thing that the world's been looking for forever. I found the Holy Grail. Literally, I found the Holy Grail. And what people don't understand is that the thing that I found is the source of all our suffering. It's the source of our suffering because it's the truth of our existence. It's the very foundation of our existence. It's the quintessence of our existence. It's the fundamental, fundamental aspect of our existence. And what is this? 
it's the beginning of our life. How many people, and Chance, I'm, this is a question to you directly, but how many people do you know actually know their godly origin? I'm not a religious guy, so when I say godly origin, I'm talking about actual, the act of creation. How many people do you know actually could tell you what, what that was? Oh, probably like a dozen, but Maybe. none in my personal <laughs> life. Nobody that like I could walk up to in person and talk to about it. I'd be naming off folks like Crow and Jason or some people that listen to my show, and that would be it. That's about it. And only those people that took the time, and I'm talking about um, those that are no longer intellectually lazy. This is, this is very, very deep and subtle, but here's the, here's the deal. This is how I started all off all the time. You got to understand that biologically, you have one beginning. And that beginning is what? That beginning is fertilization. And fertilization is the origin of the species. And when is fertilization? 40 weeks before a birthday. 40 weeks before a birthday. So imagine we go through our entire lives claiming a birthday, completely ignoring the first 40 weeks of our existence. Well, that 40 weeks of our existence that we have been cut off from is actually has become a bounty for bounty hunters, meaning that our inheritable position, our father's name, the founding father in our life, everything we thought was our, our property has been held in a trust and, and it's become subject to a bounty. It becomes a bounty for those that know that this property is available for them to find and take. And it all begins with one simple act. And that act is the clamping and cutting of the umbilical cord. That's the beginning of the end for us. It's the beginning of the end for us because once the clamping and cutting of that cord happens, it becomes a matter of fact. And that's the fact that all the courtrooms are using to separate us from our property. We claim a birthday. We claim the very fact that separates us from our property. We claim Jesus as our savior. We claim the fact that separates us from our property. And we're not any smarter we're, we're intellectually lazy to the point where we don't even want to know the truth at this point. And that's where I come in. I come in and make it easy. Let me, I'll just tell you the story and it'll make sense to you. And, and there's no religiosity to this. It's very simple. It's straightforward. And even though I agree with a lot of the esoteric aspects of this, don't get me wrong. I don't talk about that stuff for one reason. I think you need to know the fundamentals before you get into the potential wishy-washy aspects of all this. Once you know the biology, then the esoteric stuff actually has merit. But until you know the biology or the act of creation itself, I, I, I don't talk about that stuff ever. I don't talk about it because it doesn't matter if you're not here. And I mean that if you're not here, who cares about all the fluff? If you're not here, who cares about all the potential? And that's, that's, that's the problem. So here's the way I, I like to explain this. And I'm not trying to be crass, but when my mom and dad lay together back sometime back in 1959, according to the Gregorian calendar, when they lay together back in, let's say, December of 1959, what happened? What, what is the biological process that occurred? Well, my dad dropped off building materials as in the form of DNA and 23 chromosomes through his sperm. That was his donation. My mom dropped off building materials at a job site in the form of a 23 chromosome ovum. And those, that, all of those building materials are sitting there waiting for something to occur. If the something doesn't occur, then blood washes out all of that building structure, that building materials, and nothing happens. But if an act of creation, an act of God occurs, which is called fertilization, if fertilization occurs, then that act of creation results in a single cell singularity known as the zygote. That zygote then becomes the origin of the species. It's the origin of the species for all of us. The zygote is the beginning of life, biologically. Now, the interesting thing about that single cell is it has all 46 chromosomes 
It's a unique format, which means nobody else on the planet will ever have those same 46 chromosomes, which means the single cell evidences the entirety of your biological estate in one moment in time and space. So that zygote identifies everything in one single cell. And the neat thing about that one cell is it has a membrane around that cell called the pellucid membrane, which is like a fence. So the pellucid membrane around the zygote on the outside of that zygote is like a fence that identifies the scope or limits of your biological estate. Nothing outside the fence is yours and everything inside the fence is yours forever. There's no dispute over, there's no property disputes. There's no um, potential for any potential for problems if you know your godly origin. It's only when you don't know it that potential problems arise later in life. And that's kind of where I begin or that's where I, I'll take a break and let you uh, jump in here. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of stuff to respond to there. I think it's a uh, fascinating the zygote just from a miraculous level because that one cell is everything that you will be become and all that. Like it's uh this amazing fractal microcosm of your past, present and future, but the important thing to really hone in on is that the act of creation is by God or source or the creator or nature. There's no, like I can point to the exact day my parents conceived, but I can't say the minute or the hour that the actual fertilization occurred. No man knows the hour, right? It's not a, a, not a thing that men and women did or that human beings have any real claim over. It's strictly nature that does that and decides when and how and if it occurs. So. When you say godly origin, there's a very deep spiritual significance to that. Well, there's there's two things I'll respond to there is number one is you use the word conceived. And I don't use that word anymore because conception at this point, as of Roe v. Wade, conception means implantation. Implantation happens anywhere between 10 and 14 days after the act of creation. So conceived and conception are off the table. I'm going to just tell you right now, you should never, ever claim the word conception or conceive again. Use fertilization if you mean origin, because it's the only one that means origin anymore. So fertilization is the only word that, that, that brings you all the way back down to that, that spark, that, that act of creation. The other thing is this about God or about creation. When I use the word God, I only mean creation, meaning that <clears throat> biologically, my existence began at fertilization and and resulted in the biology known as zygote. Um, I like to, to, to let people know that God is anything that can create. So imagine Stephen King writing a new novel. He writes a new, sits down, creates all the characters for that novel, puts them in a, in a realm or puts them in a, 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 a town or doesn't matter what. He's God to that realm, that world, those characters. He's God because he created them. Well, that's the difference is that biologically, um, I was created through fertilization somewhere back in late December of 1959, according to the Gregorian calendar. Now, here's the difference. There is no calendar inside the womb, which means you're not subject to time in the womb. In the womb, there is no time because it's part of nature. Nature doesn't have clocks or calendars. Again, I always joke that when I look out my uh, dining room window, I never see a squirrel wearing a watch because he's not part of the Gregorian calendar. He's not part of that that idea or time-based, time-bound realm um, of the Gregorian calendar. Trees don't have calendars, you know, tacked to them so they know when to change colors because the calendar for nature is 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 nature itself there it, it, it's not subject to man-made ideas of time so in the womb there is no calendar there is no connection to time in the womb that's why the birth certificated gregorian based character is so damaging because when they when when we come out of the womb let's let's just I'll just draw a picture for you here is that when after 
mom and dad drop off their building materials after those bil- building materials are, are, are forming the new Ark of the Covenant, so to speak, the zygote. After that zygote begins its evolutionary journey um, in the womb upon the waters of mother, after implantation where that vessel then beaches into the wall of the uterus, after the the embryo uh, evolves to baby, after baby then exits the, the vagina, the womb itself, here's what people don't understand, is that the baby, the umbilical cord, and the extra embryonic manner of the baby are all one unit. When they clamp the cord and cut it, baby is outside in this world. The rest of baby is left behind in the old world or in, I'm going to call it the Garden of Eden, um, still in the waters of mother. And now there's a duality that's created. Baby gets wrapped in his swaddling clothes and goes home with mom and dad. When the extra embryonic, there's a hint, extra embryonic, meaning the rest of the embryo, the rest of baby, when the rest of baby comes out as afterbirth, that's the material that gets, that gives rise to a birth certificate. The baby doesn't have a birth certificate. You and I don't have birth certificates. We don't have any paper on us whatsoever. That's where the confusion comes in. Everybody wants to claim a birthday. Everybody wants to claim a birth certificate. But that birth certificate is for the, the, the matter that was cut off of you. It does not apply to you at all. It applies for the feto maternal organ known as the placenta. It applies to the afterbirth. It does not apply to baby. Again, I'm going to use the word misconception T- you know, kind of tongue in cheek. It's a it's a miscarriage. It's a misconception that we believe the birth certificate is for us. It's not. The birth certificate is for the rest of us that was cut off. In fact, if you really want to think about it, I mean, when we celebrate every year, mistakenly celebrate a birthday every year. Every 365 days, we celebrate. A birthday. Why would a 60, almost 62 year old man celebrate infancy every 365 days? Why would I continue to make a pilgrimage back to my infancy and reclaim infancy every year by claiming the birth certificated character? Because that's what I'm doing. The birth certificate is not for me. The birth certificate is for the material that came out after me, after me. And that placenta, the Greek word placenta means cake. So the placenta is the original birthday cake, and that's the thing that gets celebrated. We're celebrating the cake, not the baby. And as long as we keep celebrating the birthday cake, the placenta, we will always be punished because that material dies within a couple of days. And then that biology becomes a decedent estate that requires a trust, a trust fund. That decedent biology requires fiduciaries to manage it. The decedent estate requires administrative process by the courts. The man, the living man does not. So as long as we keep celebrating the erroneous birthday cake, which is already dead biologically, then we're going to always remain um, or be viewed as um, at war with with reality, at war with reality. And that's the word I I, I, at war is the key to this, because. only the, uh, a, a mentally handicapped person would continue to make the same mistake over and over and over and over for 60 plus years and not change um, uh, to fix or, or to benefit from his, his life rather than be punished. That's what, what's happening here. I, I, I'm not trying to diminish anybody else's work out there. I'm just saying that if you don't know the source of the problem, you'll never, ever get to the to the true answer and 
the biology is the answer. I, here's the answer. I'm going to give you a mantra that everybody that ever listens to your show should learn. All present and accounted for from fertilization to last breath. There it is right there. In a nutshell, all present and accounted for from fertilization to last breath. By saying that, by knowing what that means, you leave nothing on the table. There is no bounty out there for bounty hunters to capture. You remove the bounty, take the bounty off the table, and what have you done? You've removed the incentive for anybody to stop you out on the sea of commerce and try to get something from you. If there's no money to be had, if there's no incentive to stop you, there is no administrative process whatsoever, and you will be left alone completely for the rest of your life. Nobody will ever bother you. The IRS won't bother you. There won't be any court cases that come up in your lifetime. This is not about paper. This is about truth. It's that simple. John 8, 32, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It's that simple. Know the truth and end all of this nonsense. You don't have to, the patriot myth, none of that shit matters. Just, I'm just telling you up front, it's all a waste of time at this point. And I can prove it. So anyway. Uh, another <laughs> biblical statement that applies here is that you can't serve two masters. <laughs> so you brought up the whole thing about like, legally speaking, the creator is the God of their creation. So the state is the God of the citizenship of the paperwork of the straw man that is identified with by everybody who's tied to their DOB. So basically when it says you can't serve two masters in the Bible, it's saying that you're either serving nature or reality, or you're serving what is adversarial to that or satanic to that. So that's what it means to be at war with reality when you make that statement that identifying with the artifice and not with your true godly origin and all of the other uh, follies that follow on from that. Everything subsequent to the cut is a folly. Everything subsequent to the cut. Imagine, I mean, if at any point, and I want you to really think about this, but if at any point from fertilization to this moment, uh, now, how old are you? About to be 33. <laughs> oh, 33. 33 degrees is where the thawing begins. So you'll no longer be frozen at 33, will you? I've also got an interesting <laughs> birth date of 322. So, really? Yeah. <laughs> that skull and bones birthday yeah there's all kinds of interesting things about that i mean hell even my initials are kk oh you kind of cut out there for a bit kurt maybe you'll be back in a second hey we, well, there's a lot of yeah okay you're back now oh wow i wonder what happened yeah you're saying your your initials are kk which is 11 11 right yeah, that's a, just a weird thought. I mean, so again, people start throwing that stuff at me. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah I get all that. Um, but but again, let's go back to that idea of the straw man. I, let me, I'm just going to get rid of that whole concept right now. The straw man is a space holder. The straw man is is something created because you have denied it by your own omission, by lying by omission, by not identifying the first 40 weeks in a womb. There's a space from fertilization to you coming out at the port of entry to the new world outside the womb. There's a space, there's, there's something missing. The first 40 weeks are missing. So what do they do? They create a space holder, which most people know is a straw man. If you know the entirety of your existence from fertilization, can the straw man exist? I mean, technically it never existed, but- It never existed, but, they, but because in your mind, you believe in a birthday or Jesus as a savior. What happens is there's a missing 40 weeks. We call it nine months, but there's a, there's, there's a big gap in reality. And they fill that gap with a straw man until you wake up. Once you wake up, only one of you can exist because the fiction disappears the moment the truth is known. Fictions can't exist when truth is available. So once truth, i.e. fertilization, is made known, then the straw man disappears from the beginning, this is back to the future stuff. The moment you wake up to fertilization, you get in front of the cut. By being in front of the cut, the cut can't occur. Once, once the cut can't occur, then the straw man disappears completely, and you are the full owner of, of your property from fertilization. But if you keep 
continuing to to look for some magical account, some some treasury account. If you keep thinking that there's a pot of gold somewhere that you're missing, then your intent to find that or even acknowledge the separate account, separate from you, is to keep that separation alive. By even acknowledging a birthday, you, you, you keep the straw man alive. By acknowledging Jesus, you keep the straw man alive. And you're dead. By the way, only one of you can exist at any given point. So the, as long as you desire this, this treasury account to exist, as long as you are ignorant of fertilization being your godly origin and the origin of the species, you will be punished your entire life. There's no doubt in my mind. Oh, there's a lot to like link up here. You bring up the Jesus as your savior. Savior is like salvage. The afterbirth is salvaged by these pirates. and then patriots are taught this redemption myth that there's some fictional account out there that they can cash in on if they just know how to access it. <laughs> and it, we actually just covered that two weeks ago with Clint Richardson and he demolished that entire concept in triplicate, but all these things correspond. It's uh, it's savior mythology. It's, you know, all across the board, this entire world is trapped in this Messiah mythos. Well, my favorite, and, and I use a lot of biblical quotes, by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to go to one right now. It's my favorite. And, and actually I think it, it's the answer to an awful lot of stuff. Um, let me see if I can find what, one here. It's actually Luke 531 and Luke 531. Let me, let me go to it. I, I don't, I like to, to read directly. So I'm not just making shit up if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah i don't use notes so this is this is one of those rare things king james version all right now here's here's my my favorite thing especially with covid and all this nonsense out there right now covid is economic there's there's no bio there's no biology to covid at all just so you know covid is actually a title um and i'm not gonna argue with people about this because i i, I know it to be true this is not up for debate. COVID is a title. COVID is economics. It is not biology. So here, but here's, here's the answer to COVID, by the way, Luke 531. This, this is Jesus's words, Jesus. And again, I love using verbatim Jesus's words because it shuts down um, all of those people that, that claim um, the messianic aspect of, of existence. It also works within the ecumenical economy um, established back in 1945 with the UN. Now, here's the thing. Here's Jesus speaking. They that are whole, W-H-O-L-E, need not a physician. Did you hear that? They that are whole, W-H-O-L-E, need not a physician. Unbelievable. So when they cut the cord and 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 Somehow you lose all of your origin, your godly origin. When they cut that cord and somehow you lose connection to your father's name, becoming an orphan or a bastard child. When they cut that cord and separate you from the origin of the species known as man, you're not whole anymore, are you? Uh oh, I lose you. Oh no, I'm still here. I you see what I'm getting at? When they cut, yeah, when they, yeah, it was actually, but, but not for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Maybe your listeners really need to be asking themselves this question. Yeah. Right. Maybe your listeners, it's not, it, it's rhetorical for your listeners, but I'm not used to that. I'm not used I'm to sure not. Like, I'm sure not everybody knows and is familiar with this, which is why I wanted to bring you on. I know we have plenty of crossover with like Crow, but not, not a hundred percent. So this is, Crucial material. Well, I'm going to lay it down right now. And, and this is going to be absolutely mind boggling what I'm about to say. Jesus. His words. Luke 531. They that are whole need not a physician. That's Jesus. Now, the question was, is that was an answer to something. What was the question? Well, I'm going to go to Luke 530. And here's the best part. This is the part that people go, oh, my God. Luke 530 is 
the scribes and Pharisees asking Jesus this question. So why do why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? These guys are asking him a question. Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And he says, and I'm going to go back. That's when he back. says, uh, "Those who are whole do not need a physician." Right, but, uh, but I, I, I don't use I don't use the whole thing. But here, Jesus answering that said unto them, "They that are whole need not a physician, semicolon, but they that are sick." So Jesus is saying, "You don't need me if you're whole." You hear that? Yeah, and uh, I think the whole the whole thing that's lost on people with the Bible and with the new Testament is that a large amount of the allegory is about this very thing, legal fiction versus reality and the natural law. I believe Jesus Christ is actually translated as Jehovah is salvation and Jehovah is translated as the self-existing life force energy and spirit of creation eternal. So basically natural law or the law of nature, which is why you can't serve man's law and the law of nature simultaneously they which are is, in conflict which is times. why those that wrote the declaration of independence were speaking specifically of the laws of nature and nature's god they were separating themselves from rome and the only way they could do it was to identify rome's claim and then somehow set it aside through the laws of nature and that's how they became independent of Rome. They became independent of Rome by knowing the laws of nature and nature's God. But let me finish this because this is where it gets really crazy for people. So Jesus says, they that are whole need not a physician, but that they are sick. So he's saying that if you're whole, you don't need me. Jesus says, if you're whole, you do not need me. Well, that goes against everything, doesn't it? Everybody, according to the, the Roman Catholic Church, according to Christianity, according to everything, everybody needs Jesus. Yeah, the entire corporate structure of the Vatican depends on a historical messianic Jesus that the Pope can be the inheritor of as a CEO of Christ Corp, basically. And, and he can be the stand in, the vicar for, for what presumably is missing. And and that's that's where I'm going with this, which is so, even metaphorical for the missing piece, you know, the missing, the missing link, part. the yeah. missing link where the cut happens. Yeah, the fault. <laughs> Say it what it is. So if you're if you're whole, you're not at fault, are you? It all is all a beautiful, poetic metaphor that fits all the pieces together. And that's where this is going to end up. At. When I finish saying this, it's going to be like light bulbs. I'm going to be able to feel the light bulbs go on. Jesus, his own words says, they that are whole need not a physician. He's answering them and he's saying two things here. He's saying that you don't need me if you're whole. He's also claiming to be a physician. Right? And, and what's the significance of physician in that context? I mean, because it implies prescription, a prescription. Jesus, the idea or the piece that is missing, Jesus, the missing biology, the missing 40 weeks, Jesus, the Lamb of God, also known as the amnion biologically, is missing. He says, when you know the biology, when you're whole, you don't need me because you already have me. You already have me. Here's the deal. He goes on to say, but they, they are sick. So he's saying only the sick require Jesus in his own. Well, we had another internet dropout here. I'll let you know when I can hear you again. In his own words, oh. that was the last part I heard. And now you can hear me again? Yeah. Okay, I should probably just not move. <laughs> <laughs> I'll freeze for the next hour. But this is my favorite idea. If people only get one thing from me today, understand that Jesus himself, his own words, he's saying two things. They that are whole need not a physician. And then he's also saying that he's claiming to be a physician. 
Now imagine if you know what Jesus represents. Jesus and you are one and the same thing because the amnion, you, your biology, is the, known as the Lamb of God. So your own biology is Jesus. If you know your own biology from fertilization to last breath, you're not missing any pieces. There's no missing piece. There's no missing link. Which means you're not in debt or sin. Which means, which you're, which means or there, that's, the, that's the second half of this. Here's where it gets fun. If I go back to Luke 530, he says, but their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples saying, why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? So they're asking him, why, why, who, why do you hang around with these two people, these groups of people? Well, first of all, what is a publican? A publican is a Jewish tax collector. A Jewish tax collector. I thought it was just someone that hung out in pubs. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, between you and I, that's what I would think. Um, <laughs> but but it's, it's a Jewish tax collector. So I'm going to ask you something. Do you, I, and and I, you don't have to answer, but anybody that fills out or that receives a, 10, uh, a, a W-2 or fills out a 1040 or any IRS form whatsoever, nobody I know recognizes the fact that they are the tax collector. Whoever is turning in those forms are collecting taxes, aren't they? They are the ones doing it to themselves. Yeah, that's they, a really they, good it, point. It, so they're voluntary. using, right, well, it, it, yes and no. The social security number character is the publican. When you're using that character, then that's the ta- that's the one that collects the taxes for Rome, a Jewish tax collector for Rome. That's the one that's using that social security number. That's the publican. That's one side of the equation. What's a sinner? Go to the de- go to Webster's online, look up the word D E B T debt. And you'll see the word sin. So they're asking Jesus, why do you hang out with Jewish tax collectors and debtors? That's the, that's what they're asking him. And then he turns around and says, they that are whole need not a physician, which means if you're whole, you're not acting as a tax collector and you're also not a debtor. So when you get and you have the knowledge, not faith, but knowledge in your wholeness from fertilization to last breath, when you have that knowledge, you are neither required to collect taxes for Rome as a Jewish tax collector. I'll call that the Judeo side of the equation. And you're not a debtor, a Christian debtor, which is the Christian side of the the equation. Judeo hyphen Christian, right? Interesting thing about the word Jewish is that when you follow the etymology all the way back, we're really talking about the sun god deity, that particular brand of savior messianic worship, which is what they also kind of transform the allegory of Christ into in the English translations of the Bible. So like I'm talking about Jew Potter, the Jupiter, the God, the father, the rock, just like Petra or Peter is the rock of the church. It's the same symbolism all the way through and through. So when we're talking about Jewish, really in the origin of the word and the term, we're not talking about a race or a lineage of people or even particularly a religion. We're talking about an initiatory, an initiatory rank in this cult of Helios. An initiate. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's an initiate. You're absolutely right. Um, that's that. I, I just finished a call on that on the initial period. Uh, when you're learning how to write your name properly for the first time, the initial period, people go, oh, you mean a middle, middle initial period? And I go, no, it's just the initial period because there is no middle when you use a period at the end of a sentence. There's no middle, middle text. Anyway, that's a different call. But what I'm getting at is that the initial period is also the 40 weeks in a womb. So when I write Curtis R. period Kallenbach, the R. period represents the 40 weeks in a womb, which is the initial period or the initiate, if you want to look at it that way. 
So learning how to write your name, learning how to identify all of your life from fertilization to last breath is the thing that this cult, this group of people that created a system that through knowledge, and I mean knowledge, not faith, when you have the knowledge, you will be free. Remember John 8, 32, and ye shall know the truth. No is knowledge. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So it's knowledge, not faith, that frees the man. But uh, let me go back to this, this weird Judeo-Christian aspect. When baby first comes out of the womb, he's still connected to the umbilical cord. So now you have this weird straddle, this biological straddle. You have the baby at the port of entry into the new world, right in full view of everyone, in the present moment. Then you have this umbilical cord straddling the two worlds, going back into the womb, going back to the wall of the uterus where the rest of baby is still attached in most cases. So now you have baby in the present. You have this straddle through the umbilical cord back into the old world, the water-based world of mother. And then you have the rest of baby still in that realm. Unseen, still has not been witnessed yet. When they clamp and cut the cord, they actually create a duality. So baby's out here now, disconnected from his origin, biologically disconnected, physically disconnected. He gets, and everybody's, oh, look, it's such a beautiful baby boy. Well, great. But what about the rest of baby boy that was left behind in the womb? This is called an incomplete delivery. If you go to, to Webster's online and look up delivery right now, go down to the medical def definition of delivery. It says a fetus and its membranes is a delivery. When they don't deliver the membranes, that's not a delivery at all. It's a abortion. So uh, when they cut that umbilical cord, they actually create an abortion. And the abortion is the thing that is given the birth certificate, the aborted material that dies eventually uh, within a few hours or maybe a day or so, it dies. So now there's an aborted, there's aborted fetal property um, with the name Curtis Richard Kallenbach. It's given a birth certificate, but it is an abortion, by the way. By definition, it's an aborted fetus. Um, the entire banking system is based upon the abortions, which also holds everybody uh, held. Everybody's held accountable through their biology or DNA as the sureties for that aborted account, that aborted material. And again, if you're whole, there is no abortion. I don't care if there is a cut. There is no abortion when you know your origin is fertilization. And I, I, I can't say this enough. It's like going back to the future. Getting in front of the cut with your knowledge eliminates the cut, even if the cut physically occurs. Does that make sense? I think so. And I have a lot of personal revelations or thoughts about that, actually. Um, maybe we can get into in the second hour about why and how <laughs> spiritually energetically that might work. Maybe that's a little more on the too esoteric. For, no, it's, it's for okay. As down. long as you, it's okay. As long as you know the biology, because it does connect, but it has to have substance. There has to be substance to those ideas. Otherwise they're just, you just, there's an old saying, if wishes were horses, beggars would ride. That I mean, means the that Bible could, in the old Testament specifically substance is a word that means property. Is your physical body your property? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's, what, that's, the, that's the whole idea. There's too many people out there that say, hey, we're just stewards of this. No, we're not. My, my, the, my dominion over my biological estate is 100%. I am the sovereign authority over the biology. There is nobody else involved in this. If I abdicate that sovereignty, then somebody else will step in and take it over. If I divert, if I claim a new government, I don't know, a 1789 paper government or some church government overseas, I have abdicated my own sovereignty. So, again, my self-governance, my government is upon my shoulders. It is my own. It's my head. It's my dome. It's my uh, uh, um, capital. It's my capital. And the abdication is artificial, really. It's just an act. And at any point, 
you can reclaim because nature doesn't respect fiction anyway. So you may believe that you've abdicated or you don't believe that, but you may not claim responsibility for yourself. You may take the orders from the uh, the governments or the churches, but it doesn't take away your responsibility to nature or everything that you decide to do with your property, your body. There's no statute of limitations to truth. Hmm. And truth is all. People don't understand truth. They think that they have their own truth. You don't. I mean, it doesn't matter what your perspective is. If, if my favorite um, East Indian an analogy is is the the, uh, the 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 nine blind guys around the elephant. They're all touching a different piece of the elephant. They don't see the entirety of the elephant. One's touching an ear, one's touching a, a leg, one's touching a tusk, one's touching the tail, and they're all arguing about what an elephant is. When in reality, they're all right. They're oh, we lost you again there. But yeah, I love that metaphor. It applies to so much. Just, okay, now you're back. Uh, I, well, I don't know. I don't know where I go because I'm just always present. <laughs> <laughs> the internet's what lost you. Now you didn't lose Kurt. Then. <laughs> so let me let me finish this one thought about this because if people understand that what they did by cutting the umbilical cord, they created a Judeo position and a Christian position. The Judeo position is the unborn element um, in the womb. The Christian element is the, uh, I could have this reversed, I'm trying to think, but the Christian element is um, the baby on the land, the just soli. So he comes out and he's on the, he's of the soil or on the land. The uh, remaining material, the human remains that have been cut off um, is stuck back there, frozen in time on a document now. That's the Judeo aspect. So you got this cut Judeo Christianity. And the only way you can put Humpty hyphen Dumpty back together again is through um, a middleman, a medium of exchange, better known as the Bar Association. So the Bar Association is actually connecting the man on the land, the man out of the womb, back to his account, his missing link in the womb. They're acting as a bridge or a go-between or, I don't know, the... I mean, across the river sticks, they're acting as if the ferry man. I don't care what you, you call them, but they're acting as the medium of exchange between a bar even looks like a hyphen. It is. A, it is a bar. And, and, and that's why I say, you know, Judeo hyphen Christian, because that's the way it's written. Humpty hyphen Dumpty. I know that sounds ridiculous, but um, the hyphen is the umbilical cord. That's how you have to look at it. You have to look at the king of the Jews, Jesus, the cut material that's left behind. Then you have to have the baby outside. And, that, and, and what you're trying to do is put those two positions back together because of that cut. What's interesting is that the, the two positions now, which don't exist in nature, they don't exist in reality. They only exist because of a birthday or a claim to sa uh, a savior. Um, those two positions, if the unborn is, is one state of existence now and the born is another state of existence. And between those two states of existence is a place, is a space that's called interstate. That's where interstate commerce occurs, between those two states. And that's where the bar works. The bar works interstate, between those two states. If you're whole and there's no space, there's no need to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And again, the idea of the hyphen, the hyphen is a bond. The hyphen is the bond. The bond is the connection. If something is not broken, think about this. When you go grab for the Elmer's glue, what are you trying to do? You're trying to put something back together again. What is glue? A bonding agent. If something's not broke, if something's not separated, you don't need a bonding agent, do you? Right. So if you're not cut, if you're not broken, if you're W-H-O-L-E, just like Jesus says himself, if, I mean, they that are whole need not a physician. You don't need to be put back together if you're already whole. And the only way to become whole is through knowledge, knowing, agreeing with every embryologist on planet Earth that fertilization is the origin of the species. Fertilization is the act of creation. Fertilization is your true beginning. A birthday isn't arbitrary, contrived. 
um, device. Uh, it's, it, it's a tool. T-O-O-L. It becomes a tool. You're, you're a tool if you claim that birthday. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the bar word is fascinating, too, because in Aramaic, it means sun, like S-O-N. And in Hebrew, bar is a corn or a kernel, which has the same meaning in their language as K-R-N, corn or kern, corn, which is where Cronus, actually, that phrase comes from. Cronus, who is Saturn, who is symbolized with what? A scythe, a reaper. He's harvesting. What's he harvesting? What's he cutting? You know, and they all wear the black, which is the, the black robes. That's the we all know that there's Saturnian symbolism or we probably know that there's Saturnian symbolism in the bar association and in the legal realm. But do we really ask ourselves why beyond the concept that 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 uh, archetype is associated with authority and rulership? What does it have to do with corns or seeds? What are what do seeds do? They fertilize. What is a. What is it fertilizing? A sun, a bar in Aramaic. It all has very, this whole cult goes back so far. Um, and I want to ask you questions in the second hour about placenta transmission in the esoteric and in the cults that we're kind of discussing what they might do in their private realm with it. But before that, like we have about 10 minutes in hour one. What are your thoughts on if there's anyone not yet? A parent, what they ought to do, or what your thoughts are with the uh, the process of full delivery. You know, is it leave the cord, let it fall off on its own? Are there because there are cultures in the world that have all kinds of different, you know, besides the West that have all kinds of different traditions around what to do with the afterbirth. Some bury it, some consume it. There's probably other things. What are your thoughts on? All of that for people that might would like be interested in some actionable intelligence here for their future. Well, the easiest thing right off the bat is to know, to actually know your godly origin, which is fertilization. Stop with the rest. There's no way anybody just, I mean, if they don't go to the hospital, it won't matter. If they leave the cord on, it won't matter. Nothing actually matters with the system that's in play right now because they require that biological deposition, that deposit, in order to, to play within this commercial realm. You have to put the blood sacrifice down. You have to put the blood, you know, above your doorway for Passover. You have the to sacrifice do sacrifice of the firstborn. It's the sacrifice of the firstborn in every single case. Otherwise, you don't get to play. You don't get your wheelbarrow to go on, your, on the Monopoly board without the sacrifice. But that being said, when you know your godly origin, then it changes the equation. You're not running anymore. You're controlling everything because you're the owner. I mean, even in the United States, the United States recognizes the truth. The United States Code is basically the Bible coded, codified. So when, when the United States Code at 22 USC 288B says that when an owner arrives in connection with his baggage and effects, there is no IRS and there is no duty to perform. What does that mean? The owner and the baby are one and the same. So when the baby comes out of the womb, when the baby arrives to the new world in connection with his bags and effects, the connection is the umbilical cord and the bags and effects is the extra embryonic material. When he arrives in connection with his bags and effects, there is no IRS. There is no duty to perform. What does that mean? Well, they're going to clamp and cut that cord no matter what. So they're going to disconnect you. But with your knowledge and, and your willingness to let go of all your previous beliefs, you're going to actually get down to, you're going to get down all the way to truth. And when you get down to truth, it eliminates every fictitious realm. It eliminates every fictional jurisdiction. There is no fictional jurisdiction for the living man. You don't have to worry about any single fictional jurisdiction when you're living because they're all outside the scope of reality. I like to I like to ask people this. You walk into the Library of Congress. Let's say you walk into the biggest library in the world. You walk into the Rome's library. I don't care. Every book on the shelf, uh, every book in the world. Is there any book in the world that can actually harm you? Only if you hit somebody with it. Well, that, yeah, know. okay, so you're yeah. – <laughs> but what I'm getting at is there isn't a single word on any document that, that can actually hurt the living. And we have to recognize that we're the author of our own existence, of our own life. 
every all those other authorities or all those other authors have absolutely nothing to do with us. Their business is their business. My business is my business. And never um, are they mixed ever unless I have an actual agreement with somebody. I'm talking about a real handshake, you know, meeting of the minds agreement. And so all of these books, all of these ideas, all of these fictional realms, all of the, all, everything is off the table the moment you recognize reality for what it really is from the beginning. And that is fertilization. Now you're living. Once you're living, all the fictional realms become maybe even fun in some cases for, for people that want to manipulate them. But what they do is they end all of the source of suffering. The truth ends all of it. But you got to be willing to um, stay pure in your intent. I tell people all the time that if one's motive is tainted, so too will be the outcome. Meaning that if you're trying to get something um, as opposed to just seeking truth, you're probably going to get yourself into trouble. If you only pursue truth, then the benefit of truth is is reality. And reality is the best place in the world to be. So. Either you're trying to get something, um, trying to manipulate something with paper or whatever, and you're not seeking the truth, and, and, and it, you're going to suffer for that because, again, another simple way to look at this is if the truth shall make you free, then, then should you be pursuing freedom or truth? Definitely truth. The truth. The tr a byproduct of truth is freedom. A byproduct of truth is ownership. A byproduct of, of, of truth is wholeness. Um, health. Wholeness. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and so health is so, wealth. So you don't need it to is. pursue wealth. Nature will provide, like, it has everything to do with learning to trust truth. There's a reason why those words are so closely together, you know, link, like letter wise. Trusting truth is also trusting that this realm that we're part of is created for us to support us and not we're not <laughs> we're not like supported very well at all by fiction so stop stop seeking the fiction as your you know salvation basically oh maybe another little pause in our connection here uh -oh. it don't last long okay we're good <laughs> They're brief, yeah. so no, no problem. Good. Uh, it's not me stuttering or stammering. It's just, um, it is easy. It, it, it's easy for me now. It, it's I, I can tell people, you know, it took me 12, 13 years to get here, but in less than a couple of weeks, once we clear away all the nonsense and the cobwebs and all that garbage that they've been hauling around all, all their life, all of a sudden it's, it's, I mean, most people break down and start crying because they realize the, the, that they they're controlling everything that they still have all the power and they've always had all the power. It's just that we keep giving it away. We keep giving away all of our, our power. Um, hell, even by saying something is, is as simple as the powers that be, if I use that term, the powers that be in a, in a negative fashion, I mean, think about what that means. The powers that be are nothing more than presence. Those that are present, that's where the power is. It's in the present. So the powers that be are only those that are fully present. And you're only fully present when you're whole, W-H-O-L-E. If you're not whole, you're not fully present. There's a duality in your existence. If there's a duality, then you're, you're double-minded. If you're double-minded, hell, you, you got you to gotta chance heads or tails. You got you to gotta make that call. But there's no duality. There's no heads or tails. If there's no heads or tails, you don't have to make a decision. You don't have to make a choice because wholeness is not a choice. This, I think people should listen to this again <laughs> if, this is all, if this is all new to them because it, it takes a lot of uh, reframing perspective to get out of duality mindset. It's not necessarily a one-time thing, but the truth and the knowledge, once you, once you comprehend, then the rest of the knot will untangle itself over time. Yeah, it's going to be really fun for people that – think that they have to go do some, you know, paper song and dance. There's no paper required here. I write just to let people know, you know, who I am and, and where I'm at. I, I don't write because I need to anymore. Um, the world knows who I am and they, they know that I'm the only authority over that bio, biological estate. They know that. Um, 
the problem is, is nobody else cares. The, the people out there fighting for freedom don't understand that their freedom is based upon property. Their rights are based upon property, but dead bodies, dead people don't have rights. Dead bodies don't have rights. So as long as you keep claiming a decedent to state position, dead people don't have rights. Dead people can't own property. And, and I'm, I mean that if you allow the decedent to state to, 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 to be in place of yourself in, in the present moment, if your presence is no longer required, because there's a decedent to state that you're acknowledging yourself, guess what? You're going to require a, a fiduciary to manage or handle that decedent to state for you. And you keep claiming a, an infancy through or every 365 days you go back to infancy. Guess what? You will never have the capacity. You'll never reach the age of majority. You will never control anything because you're going to require a, a guardianship. If you never go past the age of one, how can you expect to be treated with any capacity? Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, so we're at the uh, end of the first hour. But my last response to what you just said, there's a reason why the dark occultists call the general public the dead. And it's exactly what you're saying. And it's uh, spiritual death to identify with artifice. So. I want you to give people your website again and how they can connect with you, any material that you might want them to check out if they're interested in pursuing your work further, but aren't going to follow us over to the second hour. And I want to give thanks for talking to me today and looking forward to maybe getting to three of my 10 questions in the second <laughs> hour. <laughs> so well, we can save it for another show if we don't get to all of it. I, no, no jellyfish.xyz is the best place to go. It's a labyrinth of information. I, if anybody wants to learn how to navigate that site, I mean, I can tell you exactly where to go through that site. Once you get in there, there's a, there's a place you should go. But again, no jellyfish.xyz. No jellyfish, by the way, means, remember, a jellyfish is spineless. Spineless is the living man. He has a spine. If he's whole, all of his biology has a spine. When they cut that umbilical cord, they actually create a jellyfish on one side of the equation. A jellyfish, spineless. What's another word for spineless? Yellow or a coward. So they're creating a, a coward on the other side of the equation through the cut as well. So anyway, see you next hour. See you next hour. Thanks, Kurt. It's been all a right, blast. Man. an absolute banger that's what they call them right when it's a really good show and i don't mean a banger just because we we're talking about reproduction type stuff <laughs> uh, I, I cracked myself up yeah i was i was excited to play on words with you there so right kurt kallenbach been wanting to talk to him for a while he blew my mind when he started going on crow triple seven i've heard him talk to rose I'm sure he's all over the place. One thing that he did not mention in the first hour, so I want to make sure and tell you now, is that on Buzzsprout, he's got basically a podcast. It's just him going on a call. He said there's 15 uploads there. New Word Order. And the significance of New Word Order as opposed to New World Order won't be lost on you if you hear the plus extension, where we have a lot to say about L and the cult of hell. And how it goes back to the Greeks and Kronos. And yeah, it's deep. <laughs> Second hour is awesome in this episode. I mean, the first episode, first hour was great too, right? Like 
this whole origin of the species question, it is simple and brilliant. And the truth is usually simple. And it's time that we quit being at war with ourselves and get back to wholeness at war with nature. I really think that the entire problem starts and ends in the mind, really, more than anything. More, we don't need anyone to correct our correct us or fix our status or whatever. We just need to live according to truth and the truth will set us free. As in the more that we adhere to truth and live by the truth, the rest of reality will sort itself out and arrange itself in alignment with truth as we do, because we're the center of this mandala. That is the entire universe, your personal subjective universe, your slice of infinity get ourselves in alignment with truth more and more and reality will become more and more true and beautiful and harmonious. It is, it, it does work that way. I, I know from personal experience. So, you know, funny thing, Kurt was kind of having some dropouts. I think maybe his laptop needed to be charged. It wasn't plugged in. I don't know. But the great thing is right when we ended the conversation, right when I was like, boom, turning off the record button, he fell out of the call permanently because <laughs> his laptop died. So. That's some divine timing right there. Absolutely magnificent. And of course, we can't always control when there's going to be dropouts. The second hour, actually, that only happened one time. And they were short little pauses anyway. It's no big deal. It's just the business. I'm not going to complain about that any more than I need to. However, I really liked the way this followed on from Clint a couple of weeks ago. The redemption myth, the savior hoax. Why should we, why should we fall for this? Again, after so many generations of variations on this damn redeemer, redeemer of the damned, <laughs> we're not, we don't have to be debtors. We don't have to be sinners anymore. It's time to become spiritual creditors, as Topher talked about in the second hour of the last episode with Topher, which was really good. Really, really good. Hope you heard that too. So yeah, this whole question of the crafty cut, and I mean that this has to do with the craft, which is what they call deception. Mischief, the Masonic mischief, if you will. We've really got all the power in this situation. I, the only thing is, I don't know if I have the heart to tell my mom and dad I don't want to celebrate my birthday anymore. <laughs> uh, because, you know, if I, if I know the truth, does it really hurt anything for me to celebrate that I exist or celebrate that someone else exists in this world and the day that they, came out of the old world and into the new world? I don't think so. It's like Kurt said specifically, maybe this was an hour two, but he said something like, I don't need uh, to, uh, words mean what I say they mean. I'm the author, right? So if I'm the author myself, then my birthday party <laughs> means what I say it means. And I don't have to identify with the straw man fiction just because I want to, uh, have this fun celebration with mom and dad. Maybe I'm a little sensitive to this because I'm about to have a big birthday in about a month, my 33rd, which is fun. Yeah, I think I said that in the show, so you already heard that. That's a repeat. Anyway, um, I want to talk about the plus topics before I continue going on and waxing. This is probably going to be a long outro. So if you don't know, which you probably do at this point, if you made it to the Kurt Kallenbach episode and this is your first time on Interverse, welcome. Um, this is quite a deep end question to start with, but also a great place to start because it's your origin, <laughs> but interverse plus it's the two hour version of the show and we put it on Rockfin and Patreon. I say we, it's just me. I do all this alone other than working with the guest, but I'm the producer. I am the author. I am the host. I am what I am. Anyway, rockfin.com, R-O-K-F-I-N.com forward slash interverse. If you sign up there, you get everyone's entire premium catalog that is on Rockfin. It's a pretty great deal. And I do a lot of live streams there. If you don't like the YouTube, which I understand why you wouldn't like it. If you don't watch the show on YouTube or Rockfin or Odyssey or BitChute, you're missing out on the video version. Way more people listen to the RSS feed though, because an audio only show is less bandwidth and easier to manage. I get that. This show is definitely all audio. The only thing you'd be missing by missing the video is uh, my handsome face and my nice beard that's coming in so well. Anyway, we also have a Patreon, which is less expensive than the Rockfin, but you don't get all those other bells and whistles. 
patreon.com forward slash interverse. One of those places you can go to support me. And I appreciate it greatly because this is my job. And uh, well, it's my chosen vocation, I should say. It's not my job as in a trial <laughs> from God, <laughs> like the biblical Job. Anyway, in the second hour, we expanded on what makes the afterbirth material a bounty for salvagers. What kind of things maybe happen with the afterbirth in terms of manufacturing and creepy stuff, cosmetics. Yeah. We discussed Kurt's metaphorical return of Jesus in 2018 and the letters and affidavits he started sending to those holding public office to evidence his wholeness and seemingly the reaction from those public figures that followed his sending of letters. Pretty interesting. He's talked about that on Crow before in more depth, I think. We got into the etymological and biblical examples of why this biological truth is a bounty to the uh, hyenas that we call this cult of L. We also got into the multi-generational placenta transmission that might already be underway, although we definitely could expand more on that subject big time. And I, I might, in the outro, give some of my thoughts on it. Talked about the, uh, yeah, the Greek aspect of this, the etymological aspect of this, the fact that the cult is cut with an L in it. And what is the cut? And uh, at the end, I mean, we talked about so much more than this. Kurt just kind of goes on the flow, not unlike Clint. So it's hard to describe and encompass what was really in the plus extension. It was just good. But the last question that I fit in there was one from our friend Gabriel Slick Dissident, who pointed out that in the Salem witch trials, there was a targeting of midwives. And I asked Kurt about that. And it led us to some very interesting revelations about the origin of the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. So anyway, all of that and more in the second hour. I hope you sign up. It's worth it. And what's really most important to me of all is that we return to knowing our source in all things because we've lost track of that. How many things do we use, consume, resources, what have you, that we have no idea the source of it? We go to a restaurant. We eat food from probably all the same in every restaurant in terms of who's shipping it to them. The same major national corporations are probably providing the crappy GMO food for everybody. We, yeah, I, I mean, I don't eat that. I say we, I don't go there. No offense if you do, I avoid it. Maybe every now and then if I have to, I'm not going to say I'm perfect, but I like to cook for myself. I like, ultimately, I would like to know the origin of even that food. The best I can do right now is know the origin in the sense that it's grown by a local farmer, but I don't know that farmer. If I really wanted to know the origin, that origin would become myself as in I grow the food or someone that I know personally and have a relationship of, of trust with. So that's just food. What else do we do every day that we don't know the source of? How many religious people have no idea the source of their religion, their religio, right? Now, one thing that we didn't talk about with Kurt, but I've talked about it before, so I feel like it's not a huge loss if you're curious about it. I think the best conversation I ever did on the subject that I'm about to bring up, the placenta as a holy guardian angel or your spiritual twin, was with Benjamin Balderson on Odin's Alchemy, episode 13. So go look him up on Rockfin or YouTube, Benjamin Balderson. I did a big presentation very much on the spiritual side of this whole topic that we got into with Kurt today. But to summarize that a little bit, I think that it's even in the Zodiac, you see Gemini, right? Gemini follows Taurus. Taurus is the mother. It's like kind of the birth moment. And Aries, you could look at before that as, a, I don't want to say conception, <laughs> fertilization. It's what maybe, maybe that's not exactly right, but it's the beginning. It's the origin. And from there you get Taurus, the birth or the mother, the matrix. And after that, so you get implanted, as Kurt says, into the matrix, which is conception. That's different than fertilization. And following that, the birth happens in Gemini, the twins. Two things are born. And those two things are then cut. What is the crab cancer following that? It's got the pincer, the claw, it cuts. Anyway, I think that this Gemini aspect of placenta has everything to do with our holy guardian angel conceptually and even our light body ship or Merkaba. Because it is a vessel physically that we come into this world on, 
but every living being has bioelectricity or life force energy that is spirit. Spirit is not a non-physical thing, really. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that like there's no existence outside of or after or before your body, but you're nowhere <laughs> or now here, <laughs> which whichever way you want to look at it. And so it's kind of like the void. You're nothing and everything at once. Maybe this is all conceptual. My point is that you have a spirit, a spirit, your physical body, people that you know who have crossed over or left their body. They have a spirit that is even still interactable interactable with you can interact with that's a better way of saying it i know because i have and uh to me that means that the ship that you come in on your holy twin your spiritual double even though that part of you has died physically as in the afterbirth is no longer physically living there is it was a biological living being it shares your dna 100 percent and if it's dead, then that means it's life force energy or its spirit is now nowhere or now here. It's with you. But if it's been traumatized and thrown in the trash or turned into makeup or whatever it is that happened to your afterbirth, it's a thing that spirits of the deceased that had a traumatic death, they need help with crossing over or they need help with healing or becoming whole. And I think that all of this healing happens in the mind. So to me, it's very possible, very likely that making this connection to our divine origin, if we really do it <laughs> correctly, whatever that looks like, if we really respect it, if we really find a way to commune with or connect with and heal this part of ourselves, then it may serve and function as a guide or a psychopomp for our spirit on a vessel or on a journey back to God or through the, you know, the astral realms to leave our body and have a guidance system or a way to do that, a way to see while we're traveling through the sea of the spirit. Yeah. So all that's pretty convoluted, but I do agree with Kurt that this idea of the placenta is the Holy grail. It might not be the only thing that could be symbolized as the Holy grail, but it's definitely the Holy grail and a grail is a vessel by the way, and a vessel is a ship. So there's that. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to wrap up this outro. There's so many things I got to say still. So I'm not really wrapping it up, but we have a, a really exciting announcement. I say we, it's just me. <laughs> I have a really exciting announcement. I guess there's a we involved. I did an audio book for Dylan Sicosio. I produced his book. July's End book. It's Spirit World, July's End with Black Swans. And you can get that audiobook on Audible or just buy it on Amazon ind individually. So here's the best way to do it. Find the link in the show notes. And if you've never signed up for Audible, you can get the first month for free, which means you get one book a month with that uh, service. That's how it works. You get the first one for free. So get July's End for free with your first one if you want. And uh, or if you want to start with Spirit World Book One, which is the definitions, be my guest. But there are three books in that series. You do not need to read them in order necessarily. They are interrelated information, but they're not linearly written. So you could start with July's End, which is the one that I produced. There are audiobooks of the other two produced by Emma Emilia, who is also a great reader. She did a good job but wasn't able to complete the third one. So I got the project, which is good for me. I'm really excited because it was fun and I learned a lot. Some of the things I discussed lately and put into the plus topics with Kurt today, I only have that knowledge. So locked in is because I've read over it over and over again <laughs> and listened to myself reading it to make sure the audiobook turned out good. So anyway, as I was saying, you get the first month free. Stick around for two more months and get the next two Spirit World books if you want to get all three for $30 for three books, basically paying for two months of Audible and getting one month free. And I get a bounty reward for that in a commission sense. And it's really helpful to me if you get something and I get something, but all you did was pay for the thing that you wanted and you didn't send me anything extra. And you got the thing that you wanted for cheaper than if you bought it without my bounty link, if that makes sense. Now, if you've already been an Audible member and just want to pick it up, it still helps me. It helps a lot. But if you've never signed up and you use my link, that's great. Anyone that buys the book without the link is still going to support me. 
So either way, it works. I'd love for you guys to check that out because the knowledge in it is next level. I'll probably be talking to Dylan soon about it and about other things he's got coming up. Spirit World Book 4, which hopefully I'll get to do the audiobook for that too. Now, all that said, I probably need to plead and beg you to buy that book more, but <laughs> I won't. Just know that you're missing out if you don't read Spirit World or listen to the audiobook. Prefer the audiobook. Probably good to get both. It's nice to look at it visually, I'm not going to lie, because we're talking about language and etymology. Right, so other ways you can support me and get something in return. We can work together. I can use my Oracle cards, Tarot and I Ching, really, and some other cards I throw in the mix, but the primary, uh, primary magic is coming from I Ching and Tarot. We can work together, do some spiritual counseling, let the cards divinely guide us to synchronistic knowledge and information, messaging from yourself to yourself about how you feel about your life right now and where you're going. It's like kind of like kinesiology, but for your mind, <laughs> for synchronicity. Yeah. And I also do sound healing, which is really, really powerful. It's an amazing modality. It works remotely. I've talked about it a gang of times. I won't go too deep into it. Look on my website for more information. There's a link in the show notes for that as well. I'd really love to see how I can help and assist. The modalities are both quite divinely guided for me. And yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to connect with everyone that has come to me for a session of either cards or sound healing. The tuning fork stuff, though, it is next level. It is hard to overestimate the possibilities and potentials with that particular ceremony. It's really something. So I'm going to play us out with a song called Borderline by Sha One. And Sha One is also known as Sean. He is a guy who's in our Telegram group. He doesn't even know that I picked his song to play the outro for this episode, but it feels right. Borderline feels appropriate for this question of the cut. And uh, Sean, Sha One, <laughs> Sean is a great dude, really impressive musician. Uh, an, an excellent contributor to our Telegram channel, which if you're not in, why not? Our Telegram is super fun, as you might say, Liddy Kitty, or as I might say, you probably don't say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, links to Telegram in the show notes too. So many links in the show notes, like 20,000 links. It's almost all links. Go through them. There may be something you didn't know is there. Like, you can support me by buying supplements from Clive DeCarl and get really, really high quality magnesium and vitamin C and other supplements. And I get a cut, a kickback. Really nice. Uh, there's other places on there you can, uh, in the links like t-shirts, Interverse t-shirts, anybody? I really need to update the merch store and get more cool merch in there. I know. I'll get around to it. I will. Lately. Last couple of days during Mercury retrograde, especially in Venus retrograde, it's playing too many video games. <laughs> it's not good. Not good use of my time, but it was fun. Right. So that's probably everything I needed to say for the outro. Maybe not, but I did my best and we're 20 minutes deep. So I'll probably wrap it up here. Would love to have Kurt back. Let me know what you think of the show. Join our telegram. Watch Vibrant on Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. on YouTube and Rockfin or catch the replays everywhere else. Vibrant is super fun. We had a great one last week with Rachel Munoz. Munoz? Yeah, Munoz. <laughs> I struggle with that last name. But we talked about gene keys and runes and other forms of divination systems. And at the second hour, we had a lot of call-ins from our great friends, Gabriel and Kaylee and... Kaylee the Astrologer, Gabriel Slick Dissident, and Ariel was a new caller. Shout out Ariel. She's got a great YouTube channel too. If you want to know what I'm talking about, go to my YouTube or Rockfin channels. Check out Vibrant episode 25 from last week. Although by the time you hear this, there will have been another Vibrant or two. So this is kind of an early, I kind of recorded this way earlier than it's really coming out. Anyway, I'm done. Checking out Shaw, checking out with Shaw One, Borderline. Thank you, Sean for being cool in our telegram. Enjoy your tunes. And thank you everybody for listening to Interverse and all the ways you support me, especially if it's in one of the ways, the many, many ways I just mentioned <laughs> where I, you can help me help you. And 
I appreciate it. I love you guys very much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.